Everybody feeling the pressure right now, including the coaches. Jack Williams going to launch it immediately. This is going to get to the end zone. Championship weekend on the line, and the disc is caught. The New York Empire are going back to the championship weekend. Ryan Oscar catches it at the buzzer. New York 22, Atlanta 21, Williams to Oscar. back it's swing pass week seven preview pod coming at you another 13 game banger of a schedule ahead of us this weekend three scintillating days of ultimate action starting on friday night with a rematch of the 2022 west division championship game the 6-0 salt lake shred taking their first place record on the road to colorado to face the 5-0 west division champion summit the Summit have been surging lately. Their defense looks even better this year, but the Shred have something to say about that. They'll be bringing their new additions, Grant Lindsley, Elijah Jaime, and the rest of that fantastic playmaking squad on the road. Salt Lake, of course, falling all three times in their matchups last season. A lot of good, bad blood going into Friday night's contest. On Saturday, we have another huge playoff rematch. This one Going back to 2021, the last time Atlanta and New York played, that game game decided by a Ryan Osgar walk-off buzzer beater to send New York to the championship weekend. Atlanta, they're 4-1 this season. They sit atop the South Division standings. They will play Boston on Friday night, and then on Saturday night, they will go into New York to face the reigning AUDL champion, New York Empire, 6-0 in Saturday's Game of the Week event. Also on Saturday, there will be a battle in the South Division between Carolina and Austin. Austin, of course, getting a season-defining win against the Flyers at home last year at almost the exact same time of the year. So, really interesting turn there. Flyers, 4-3. and three. They split last weekend's road trip in D.C. and Philly. They're looking to rebound a little bit. Meanwhile, 5-2 and two, Austin has kind of been cruising through their very Texas-heavy schedule, looking for a little bit more battle tests as they build their playoff resume in the back half of this season's schedule. There are nine other games there. I did mental math on the fly there. Nine other games on the weekend slate. We're going to try and get to as many as we can, but we really want to sink our teeth into those three big feature matchups, starting with the West Division showdown on Friday night. Daniel, this is one of those games where you can take so many different angles on this. There's the individual matchups. You got the Jordan Curvers, Cody Spicer, the, mm -hmm. the MVP runner-up and probably the MVP favorite through the first six weeks of this season. Jordan Kerr going up against the reigning defensive player of the year. And Spicer, you've got this high-octane shred offense that's just clicking at a new level this year versus this stout physical, aggressive Summit defense. You've got Jonathan Nethercutt slinging the rock for the Summit offense versus this young and recalibrated shred defense that loves to fly around, play with a ton of energy. You know, again, Colorado won all three of the matchups last season. Salt Lake has just mm -hmm. so much momentum and I think want for this game. Where do you start? Like, what? where does your brain kind of go to when there's just <laughs> so much juiciness to this Salt Lake Colorado rivalry already I mean I, rivalry might be too far you know Colorado is taking care of business every single time it's a rivalry it's on this for now but shred trying to make it a rivalry that's for sure yeah I mean it's it's pretty clear even though it's been one-sided yes in the the outcome of these scores like this is this is a rivalry these are two expansion teams came into the league at the same time top of the west division pretty much all last season and they're doing it again this year, right? Undefeated, 6-0 versus 5-0. My mind immediately just goes to the Jordan Kerr-Cody Spicer matchup, if we get, if we're lucky enough to get that go. matchup. Good place because to go. Kerr, like Kerr's worst game of the season by far came at home in Salt Lake. Spicer just absolutely shut him down. It's interesting to me, though, the, the way the Salt Lake offense has like 
really expanded around Kerr, and they have more pieces this year. You mentioned Grant Lindsley, and you got guys like like Jacob Miller and Luke Jorgensen and McKay Jorgensen, like all stepping up into like bigger, a little bit more aggressive roles. Kerr hasn't needed to be that like driving force to get the disc in the end zone as much, which I think is a, it, it's like a troubling point for Colorado. Whereas like before is like, okay, shut down this one guy and you're going to disrupt the entire shred offense. I kind of think even if Spicer is able to get the better of Kerr in that matchup, there's just there's a lot of other things going on that's all like offense. So I'm almost like I guess I'm wondering how big of a deal that one on one matchup is this year compared to like the stage it was on last year, if that makes sense. No, I think that's a terrific point. It actually kind of brings up one of the things I wanted to talk about specifically with lineups going into this game, and that's that Denver is obviously going to have I shouldn't call them Denver anymore. They're in Golden, Colorado, Colorado isn't going to have some pretty notable playmakers on the defensive side of the disc. They haven't had mm-hmm. Kai Marshall for a couple of weeks. He's working back from injury. There's a host of players who were not active last weekend, who are active this weekend, who all have questionable or like hamstring tags next to them in their roster activations. Connor Olson, mm-hmm. Matthew Agee. These are terrific players. I'm a little worried about them getting up to speed in this particular matchup against a high octane shred offense that to your point is just clicking everywhere right like all their pistons are firing you can't really yeah. focus on any one part and then the biggest absence is actually a rookie for the summit Saeed Semrin he's been one of my favorite defensive players to watch the series a big guy mm-hmm. gets out into space has a great motor I think he's one of those players who really understands that he can put his size into p- specific situations and just muck it up for offenses and he's been yeah. the block leader through the first five games for this summit team he's one of the league leaders in the year in the entire league in takeaways he's just been a terrific presence for them and a hustler and i think someone who they would really really like in this matchup because he can take some of those other pieces it's it's hard to call somebody like a jace dunabile who's having <laughs> right, a right. fantastic or sean, sean canole yeah like whatever yeah, yeah. These, these are these are very, the other very guys. skilled players. And it just it, it's one of those things where to lack having Semrin, who's been so, so good for the summit, I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried because, to your point, y- you know, this, this shred team is evolved. They're different. Last year, it was so much of a focus fire laser can- cannon through Kerr. And this mm-hmm. year, he's still obviously just as dynamic with or without the disc as a thrower, as a receiver as almost a decoy piece. If you take too much and uh, invest your resources into him, the offense can go away from him and run away from you. Like I I really like all those developments. And I just think that there it's so weird, right? Like Colorado should have, I think a little bit of the cosmic momentum here, given how well they performed last year, but for whatever reason going into tomorrow night, I like Salt Lake on the road right now. I I really I think it, it's similar to like last. Is it the year lineup absences? Do you feel somewhat. like the lineup absences are too big of a deal? I think going on the road is a really good thing for the shred team. I think that they're so young and they feed so much off of the home crowd that in that first matchup at Salt Lake last year, you saw it kind of work against them a little bit when they fell behind early. Then all of a sudden, the expectations start to go in your head. You can see the mistakes kind of piling up, a lot of miscommunications, a lot lot of just weird little nerve touches around the disc where there's juggles and bobbles and that whole thing. And Mm -hmm. if you contrast that with the first time they played in Colorado, that Salt Lake team had a four-goal lead on the road in the third quarter. They were crisp. They weren't missing stuff. They knew that they could not have miscues in that environment. And given the way that Salt Lake is playing, And given the way that they've drastically reduced the number of turnovers per game from last year, they've drastically reduced the kind of feverish plays that befuddle expansion teams in particular, and also the West Division specifically. Um, And I think that with all of that, this is a favorable matchup for Salt Lake. And and I don't say that to take anything away from the Summit. I think Summit are absolutely a championship contender this year. I have the number two in my power rankings this week. I just Mm -hmm. like how Salt Lake has sort of built into this matchup that you know that they had circled on their calendar from the moment this entire season schedule dropped back in January, February, right? Yeah. 
No, of course. I, I do think it's interesting, though. The first matchup w- between Salt Lake and Colorado that we saw last year, it did come pretty early in the season. Like, Colorado definitely took some time to kind of hit their peak form last year. So it just felt like they were a much more well-rounded, much more cohesive and put together team later in the season. And I think that's part of the reason why they were able to run away with the second two matchups. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious because Jonathan Nethercutt did not play last week for Colorado against Oakland. They're like the offense, like the way everyone rallied around like Quinn Finer and Alex Atkins and like the absence of John Nethercutt arguably made it look better at times in your opinion let's let's talk about the the nether cut factor because obviously he is like a game-changing thrower no one is denying his throwing talent but with it comes a lot of huck throwaways and do you feel like this game is gonna just like overemphasize the value of like possession and like maintaining you know limiting throwaways and just making sure your offense is a, as efficient as possible and, like, is Colorado going to be the same, like, air it out team that they usually are when they have another cut at the helm? Yeah, I – it's funny. I think last year Colorado very much wanted to make things more precise, eliminate mistakes, kind of make it a more turnover-based battle, whereas the Shred yeah. were just bombarding you. They wanted to open everything up, yeah. play it like a video game, make big plays, feed off of energy. Like, that was sort of the 2022 Summit or excuse me, Shred, I think Mm -hmm. that that's sort of shifted a little bit this year. And that's just, again, the early season approach about these teams. Summit is once again working in a lot of new pieces this year. They've got a lot of interesting additions. Salt Lake certainly has some at the top end of their roster, but I feel like the full formation of who the Shred are is still pretty consistent with who they were last year. Whereas Summit, I think, are developing a slightly new style this year. I think they are becoming... A little bit more defensive focused aside from their week, week six win against Oakland you see a little bit more of mm-hmm. we're okay turning it over because you got to go into the teeth of this defense if we do right um so I'm wondering if in this matchup if some of those volatile nether cut turnovers aren't as impactful as maybe in prior matchups like I'm thinking about the West Division championship game where the nether cut turns did, I think, have a little bit of an impact on the shred rallying and getting into that game in the second half, right? Like, I do mm-hmm. think that there is a given a take to it. I think, though, that given how the Summit have such confidence in their playmaking and their athletes, that it will be less of a issue for them on Friday. I, I think that to your point of how the team kind of rallied in response of him not even being active last weekend... I think that, yes, there might be one or two nethercut sort of just rips to take them, but they're not going to have an outcome on the game. And, of course, yeah. we might put this on Sunday night and say, look, there were five nethercut throwaways, and that was the difference in the game. But right. I think for, right. for whatever reason, I have this belief that Colorado is a little bit more loose this year with how they're approaching games. They're a little bit more... We'll take things as they come. We just kind of have a trust in our system and our ability to win. And it doesn't have to be the cleanest, most precise thing right now. We're kind of working mm-hmm. on what these rotations resemble. We're working on what our our optimal level is. And so, again, this is way too long of an answer for what you asked. But I, I think that Atkins and Finer and the rest of that offense showed, hey, if we need to play a separate style, we can do that. Right. Absolutely. Right, like, and I think they they can be adaptable in that way. To your point, um, which makes sense. One last thing I'll I'll mention is that there's no Joel Clutton in this game. He's not playing with the shred this year, so unfortunately, we do not get the Clutton versus Frude rematch that we loved seeing last year. So maybe that encourages a few more deep shots when you don't have Clutton roaming around the deep space. Who knows? There's a name that we should actually mention too, because Fruit was massive in these games last year. Oh yeah, like Fruit went had, off like, in the, perfect, the Colorado uh, home game. He had the perfect throwing performance in the first meeting between the two yeah. teams, and just kind of was it like big eleven spark scores in, or something? Yeah, and like was a big yeah. spark as to how the summit kind of came back in the second half. He they just kind of rallied around Fruit and a few of their veteran. Uh, pillars and then mm-hmm. in the week seven game he had the huge sky against Clutton where Clutton I think maybe got 
one against them early, but Fruit had that like yeah behind his head like coming back. Yeah, they were always it was always high. back and forth between the two. But yeah, he yeah. I mean such a playmaker in the deep space. Right. But I to the point, I think that Fruit is maybe a name that elevates in this game. He's been having a good season. It's just been kind of in third gear. He doesn't have to do much as evidenced by have, how yeah, much there's talent is on the around but, right but this feels like one of those games where if they don't put the right kind of defender on jay fruit he suddenly has 350 yards receiving you know yeah. seven total scores and it's just sort of threading all of the gaps that allow another cut finer and atkins to get into their hot spots and whenever that right. happens it's trouble for a defense yeah definitely no i think fruit like you said he still still very much possesses the ability to like go into takeover mode when needed. So who are you picking? I think I kind of gave away my pick. I, I'm going to pick the shred. I want an upset. I want something to kind of <laughs> change a little bit in this narrative. I think it's more of a yeah. watch pick than necessarily going for my logic centers up here, but... Sure, I, again, sure. I, 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 I like the trajectory of the shred right now. I... I like I want I also want the upset. I think that's good for good for the league, good for the narrative. But I am taking the summit to to hold strong at home. Uh, I don't think their lineup absences are anything too detrimental. I think they have enough depth to fill in those pieces defensively. And the shred. I mean, the conditions were a bit of a factor last week, but last week was the first week that their offense didn't look like totally, you know, clean the whole time against Oakland. And I think Colorado is going to bring a lot tougher matchups individually. Yeah. And that's not necessarily like the stoutest of Oakland defenses either, right? I, I No, do it's really it's there really was, not. There was a little bit of a smudginess to their play last week that wasn't there through the first five games for the shred. And yeah. you gotta wonder was maybe that was them um, looking ahead a bit to this matchup. Maybe they were working on some stuff that was more set up for their face off at the summit, just kinda hypothesizing out here, but We'll move on. We'll move on to our huge game of the week matchup. The 4-1 Hustle taking on the 6-0 New York Empire on Saturday night. I'm watch.audl.tv. These two teams met twice in 2021, giving us two of the best games of like the past half decade. The regular season battle in Atlanta, the Hustle coming out on top in that one. It was when Atlanta looked like the best team in the AUDL at that midway point of the 2021 season. They out yeah. big boy the Empire in that game. I mean, that that is one of the most highlight filled games I've ever seen. <laughs> Go and watch it on the AEDL YouTube channel if you haven't already. It's just literally four quarters of insanity and just kind of tit for tat playmaking. And I, the biggest takeaway for me in that game was that the hustle outplayed the Empire in that kind of sphere. And we hadn't seen that happen for the last like season and a half where some team just. Yeah went out to open field and said, stop us to the empire, right? And it almost feels like since that moment, the New York sort of mindset has slowly shifted from almost like highlight-driven offensive plays and Benyat and everything to this more <laughs> defensive-minded machine that we have yeah. now in 2023 Boring. with this empire defense that just chews up opposing offenses. Um, so talking about this matchup, these are two very different teams from the last time that they met. They've sort of been going in a little bit opposite directions too. It really felt again, like that was a high point in 2021 for Atlanta. And obviously they had an eight, four season last year, they're four and one this year, but it's always kind of underneath the glass ceiling of we need to get one of these big wins back. And on the opposite side, you have this reigning champion, New York team who is starting to, I think, return a little bit more to a reality basis with some of these results, but is still just mm -hmm. kind of battering opponents. I mean, they held Montreal to 10 goals <laughs> at home. It's just, and it's yeah. and it's like this every week against Empire defense. They just sort of chew through you. This was, even with a lighter travel roster, they were missing starters on defense. It mm -hmm. didn't matter. They had Zach Burpee stepping up. The Dross looks fantastic. They're really solid in running their counterattacks. This is just a sturdy New York team, and it's just hard to see where exactly the weaknesses are yet. So my question for you is, what can Atlanta bring to this matchup? What is the thing that they can excel at again against New York, right? Like in that first matchup ever meeting in 2021, it felt like they had the big play and the ability to strike deep with their offensive hucking game. 
Is that yeah. the same thing in this matchup? Or are they going to be more drive focused? They seem like yeah. a little bit more of a possession based team this year than the ATL teams that favor the long ball. Uh huh. It's it's been interesting to watch Atlanta this year because I think they they've like varied their approach so much on offense throughout the season. They have had games where they were just connecting on those deep shots, like between Bobby Lay and Austin Taylor. That's always going to be kind of like in their back pocket whenever they need to bring it out. But I think they have just gotten like overall a little bit tighter and cleaner offensively where they're not like overly reliant on those deep shots. Whereas you see a team like Philly where like that's their whole identity. I think Atlanta has spread out a little bit more and is, is definitely more versatile with the pieces that they have. However, I do, I do think back to that 2021 playoff game and Atlanta in the first half was just connecting on every single deep shot. And those were like punishing blows for an empire team that, you know, has felt on top of the world since going undefeated in 2019. And the fact that they they forced New York to really climb back into that game uh, and play like Jack Williams and Ben Yacht on like every point of the second half, they made them really uncomfortable with the fact that they were just outplaying them and out highlighting them, kind of like you said in the in the first matchup too. So I don't know, to me, I think that that is kind of how you get New York a little bit out of their comfort zone is yes, New York is, is like very methodical, both offensively, defensively. But if you can land some of those big plays early, like Matt Smith started the game with his 300th goal, which was just a phenomenal layout grab. Uh, you know, t- Austin Taylor is hitting, I think, 100% on his hucks in that first half. I I see that as like maybe the best chance Atlanta has of taking this win from New York. But I also have to ask you, how much does it matter that this is the second game of a doubleheader? Because they're playing Boston the night before. I think a lot. And it was going to be one of the things that I, I worry about in the specific matchup for Atlanta is that Boston defensively has actually been pretty good this year. They run teams. They they're they're effective better. on the counterattack with Brendan McCann. They've got some night. Tyler Chan has been good for them as a stabilizing thrower too on that mm-hmm. D line. Like they, they challenge teams in a way that Boston hasn't the past two seasons. You know, I would say, right past two years Atlanta gets a Friday game against Boston then heads to New York that's a good that's a good appetizer that's a warm-up you get some reps in you get a little bit more sharpened for a matchup against the Empire that's not the case in 2023 right Boston's three and one they're a very serious playoff contender to this point in the season and they're acting like it and I think that the hustle very much have a little bit of a focus issue of they have to take Boston seriously on Friday but then that's, of course, going to take their eye off the ball just a little bit from this Empire team who you need to invest 100% of your attention in. And right. the particular thing that worries me about Atlanta going into New York is that the Empire don't take the kind of risky shots that they did in 2021. They're not just looking to airball it out. If you start doing it against them, they might respond with five straight possession-based drives, you know, through Solomon yeah. Rushmeyer, yeah. Bailey, and that incredible backfield. Like they're not, they're not looking to impress people anymore with anything other than extending this winning streak and getting their third championship in four years. That's all they care about. And you see that with how they're using Jeff Babbitt right now, right? Like it's sort of like this boxer that midway through a match puts on brass knuckles. Like they're, they've been punching you, you're, you're trading punches with them, you're counterattacking. And then all of a sudden they just start doing these drives where they're like, we're just going to go to Jeff Babbitt to close it out, right? Like we're just, that's all we're doing now. We're just going to Babbitt in the end zone. And I'm worried that if this game slows down again and New York does what what they did in the second half against the Hustle in the playoff game, that they're just going to run Babbitt down the Hustle's throats and just (laughs) hold on to whatever lead that they have, right? Like that's, that's the back pocket wing condition that the Empire have this season. They have the league leader and goal scorers. They have this literal hulk who just doesn't have a peer right now in one-to-one matchups and they know that they can kind of try some stuff and get a little cute and go into fast breaks but when it all settles down they're just gonna get the ball to the big boy and let him go to work you know he's Shaq then they know to use him in the post (laughs) and it's just it's one of those things where in the 2021 regular season matchup that the hustle won they they did kind of work 
the Empire into a frenzy of, we got to get Osgar more involved. We got to get Yacht more involved. We need to strike quicker, mm-hmm. strike harder. And it's like, that's not the approach anymore with the Empire. They just sit back, let you come to them. They make a few adjustments. Their defense just starts feeding your feet first into a wood chipper that by the third and fourth quarter, your offense just doesn't want to go on the field anymore because you have to execute 100 plus throw drives against them and get beat up in the lanes by the Dross and whatever else. And it's just, I don't know. It's like the opposite of the last matchup we were talking about where I like Atlanta a lot this year. I don't know that I like them in this matchup, given all the other factors circling into it. I think Boston is going to take, a pretty sizable punch at them on Friday. It would not surprise me at all to see glory upsetting Atlanta on Friday. I just think, yeah, you know, we talk about toughest road trips and I think right at the the front of that is like Carolina, Atlanta, the, the altitude test of Salt Lake and Colorado. But right mm-hmm. now this Boston, New York one is a bit of a sand trap, right? Like you think that you really got to put all your work into prepping for New York, but like, Boston deserves attention right now. Boston is going to run you. Boston is going to try to knit and grit their way to wins and and keep pushing into the playoff picture. Yeah, I and I think what I was saying before about like the hustle kind of taking a, a fast paced aggressive approach that really only works well in like a like a one off game situation or or like a home game for Atlanta where it's like you know the guys are all fresh, well rested, like they're ready to go and just hit the ground running immediately. I I agree with you. I'm a bit worried about that Boston game and what it does for Atlanta going into New York because I just think that it's there's only so much of like a fast start you can do in the second game of a doubleheader against a team like New York that, like you said, has all these defenders just roaming around the field ready to make an impact. So it's going to be a tough ask for Atlanta to, to get this win. I do, I am looking for though, the Babbitt matchup, I think last year or in 2021, we saw, was it in overtime that it was like the Babbitt sky over yeah. Holzmeier? Yeah. Uh, I, I want I want a lot of Babbitt versus Holzmeier. I know Holzmeier is playing a lot more offense this year. Still looking forward to that matchup. But like you said, in the red zone, like there is literally zero, there are zero people that can defend Babbitt in a one-on-one situation. And New York has been so good at just, getting him in isolated positions. So when it comes to red zone work, I, I think it doesn't matter who's on Babbitt, but just like if New York gets involved in the deep game a little bit, I want some shots going up to the, the Holzmeier and Babbitt downfield. Uh, just two other points in this matchup, and then we'll move right along. Uh, hustle our confidence team. And so kind of to flip on what I was just saying about Boston could be a, a big matchup problem for them on Friday. If they get a good win against Boston, like a, three to four plus goal victory, that mm-hmm. could be great for the hustle. Because when Atlanta's playing up, as you saw in their first matchup against the Flyers, they look like a championship team. And so the true telltale, I think, would be kind of how they emerge from that Friday night tussle in Boston. Uh, the other point yeah. I wanted to bring up was that Jakeem Polk and Misha Frey's daughter are both listed as questionable for this weekend. Two mm-hmm. big, big performers for the hustle. Polk was fantastic in the regular season meeting in 2021 against the Empire. Misha was ostensibly signed this season for a matchup like this one in New York. And so yeah. his six foot seven presence will obviously be missed if he can't make the lineup and just will ensue a number of what if scenarios. And you talk about a matchup. How about Frey Stoddard versus Yacht? Huh? Would love that. Yeah. I, Give me I, all I, of that. That's, that's, the one, that's the one I want to see. We haven't, I don't know if we've ever seen that one before. There might have, trying to think. Ah, I think one time well, and one. No, because in, tw- in 2019, when that's right. was one of the Flyers, they both played offense. So, like, and I would, you probably yeah. never saw it. I mean, they did play together, but yeah, you're right. There was one yeah. time they were, they were on the field together, but they I would love to see another one of the yeah. Uh, let's move on to the third game that we're going to kind of chew into, and then let's just go through lightning round after that. Uh, the South Division yep. game, 4-3 and three Carolina going on the road to face the 5-2 and two Austin Soul. This was the matchup last season that the Flyers lost and kind of lo- launched Austin into the true trajectory of their playoff performance and kind of into the new era of how we consider them now, right? Like, that was, that was a vaulting yeah. win for the Soul. And I think they feel similarly about this matchup right now. You know, they have two losses, one of them being to the Flyers, the other one being to the Hustle. 
And, and I think Austin is now looking to reassert itself again. I, I think we went into yep. this season thinking they were neck and neck with those two more established powerhouses from the South region. And right now, I think that's a little bit more in question. And I think it has nothing to do with like talent or the abilities of these team. I think it has to do with strength of schedule. You know, we've talked about before, the Soul had probably the hardest schedule in the season going into 2022 last year. Really, really, yep. I think hardened them and facilitated their growth as a team this year they have one of the easiest schedules and i think you see that in their approach right like there are times where they look amazing evan swiatek continues to fly through the air like he has a propeller attached to him Uh, you know they've got playmakers up and down this roster duncan fitzgerald could quite possibly be the most improved player this year he went from Mm -hmm. a defensive rotation loss piece on the breeze to like the center handler for the soul attack yeah i i didn't see that one coming uh, <laughs> you know there there's a lot of interesting things about this matchup but i think it's once again going to be so much more important for a soul team that distinguishes itself specifically against carolina and atlanta than it is for this flyers team that will be without some major major pieces in joe yeah. white Liam Searles Bowes, Ethan Bloodworth, and Elijah Long. That's like their top defender in Bloodworth, their leading thrower right now on the team in Long, who leads the team yeah. in completions and throwing yards. Joe White, who was just the best player for the team last weekend on the road. And Liam Searles Bowes, who has been the backbone with Eric Taylor still looking to make his 2023 season debut with uh, uh, injury keeping him sidelined. You know, like Bowes, LSB has just been incredible whenever he's been in the lineup. He just... Yeah. He only contributes and seems to never make mistakes. Um, they're without those guys. And so I think for Flyers, it's going to, they still have a very strong roster because it's Carolina. But I think they're going to yeah. kind of go into one of their modes where they're going to try some stuff. They're going to throw some rotations you maybe haven't <laughs> seen before. And for Austin, it's, it's going to be, games. for Austin, it's going to be reform like Voltron, right? Like they've got to kind of pick up after facing, you know, Dallas and Houston and, and, getting into that headspace. And I think they need to realign into, okay, here's a playoff performer because when they faced the flyers and Atlanta back a couple weeks ago, it did not look like the soul were plugged into those games. They, they had a more loose approach in those road matchups. Yeah. I think it's, it's good. They got the wake up call earlier in the season, right. Rather than later for that, that double header road trip. It was like kind of a a pretty quick test of like, okay, what what are we going to be up against this year in terms of the playoffs, in terms of the South Division? And yeah, these this Carolina game, and then whenever they host Atlanta at home, I kind of think like, even though not not technically they have to win both those games, but like last year, they won both those home games against Carolina at home and then against Atlanta at home. And that was what clinched their playoff spot. This year, like, they're kind of a shoe in for the playoffs, right? But I just think mentally they kind of have to get at least one of those wins, right, to feel like they have a real shot at coming out of the South Division. So, yeah, it starts this week with Carolina. Like you said, Carolina's rotation, I think this is going to be one of those games that we saw earlier in the season from the Flyers where they're just like, not really any O-lines or D-lines, just kind of playing people wherever. We saw them get a lot more rigid when they have their full-strength roster with, like, Joe White and LSB, but... Without those guys, I think they're they're going to kind of break down again. And the problem for Austin was that was that was what the Flyers' approach was in that first game against Austin. It was not a, a strict O line D line game. It was it was I think it was Gucho Hannes' first game of the season. They were playing him both ways. Uh, so the problem was it just happened to all work out. Everything clicked for the Flyers despite kind of the the hazy rotations that they went with. So I'm curious to see what happens this week in Austin. I think it's a little bit less comfortable taking that approach on a road game, especially one that they did lose last year. Again, it's the second game of a doubleheader, which we saw last week. Carolina lost to the Phoenix in the second game of a doubleheader. So I don't know. Maybe there's something to be said there. But yeah, I don't know. Who who do you feel like should be favored in this game? And like, what, what would you set the line at? I think Let's Carolina should be I think Carolina should still be favored just slightly by like a goal given oh, yeah. how they've the been points. playing recently. They've won four or five. Yeah. They look like the Flyers again. And I just I I need to see it from the soul yet. I haven't seen it in their first seven games. They're five and two, they're a good team. I expect them to make a postseason push. I would just like to see a game where they lock in. Watching the Flyers yeah. lock in on the road last week. 
beat the breeze, take some of their thunder. That was mm-hmm. a big, big win in my mind. Like that's one that's going to stay up here for the rest of the season. Soul don't have that yet. And they had multiple ones last year. I'm just, yep. I'm waiting for the soul to prove something to me. I think they're good. I just need to see 2023 soul kind of put their stamp. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I, I do worry a bit about Carolina just in the sense that like they are coming off a loss in the second game of a doubleheader. They don't have their strongest lineup. They are doing another doubleheader this weekend. So like, you know, the the odds makers might weigh that a little bit more heavily than just like the pure strength of the team. But it is, it is like you said, I mean, this Carolina team is incredibly deep. The lineup absences don't matter so much. I think it just can, can mess with their approach a little bit, but you know, this is a team that tends to get better throughout the season. So I think I would agree that I'd favor them by like a point, but I am going to take Austin to pull off the upset. Five and seven Flyers playoff push is still very much in the realm of possibility. <laughs> and that's, that's like the that's truest so hope I have. Is that that I, I want the first uh, under 500 team at championship weekend. That's what I want. It would just, yeah, like we could just, we could just implode all sorts of like stats, team stats and everything with one thorough Flyers five and seven playoff run to make it to seven. It's just funny that that's, that's like such a real prediction at this point. Like it's I such know, a real like that, possibility. I'm speaking into existence, man. I started this a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> like I'm ready. I am so it's, it's ready for real. an under 500 championship contending Flyers team. Like it's coming, baby. It's coming. I mean, maybe they just, they spiral after that Philly loss the rest of the regular <laughs> season. And they're like, okay, playoff time, you know, go Flyers. Yeah, Carolina, notoriously known for spiraling out lately. They're That's done. really what those programs have been built Houston, on. Houston's going to creep up. Houston's got two wins. Houston careful. looks good. I like, I like Houston, but I don't know about all that. All right, <laughs> let's get into some lightning round. We've still got a slew of games to cover, right? There's still nine other games happening this weekend. We'll go quick. West Division lightning round. San Diego at Oakland and LA's road trip in Portland and Seattle. All three mm-hmm. of these games are really going to be telltale for the third seed in the West Division. San Diego, Oakland, and LA are all ostensibly just going to be in a battle for that for the remaining weeks. For LA, this feels like they have to go 2-0. and Oakland went 2-0 and on the same yep. road trip just a couple weeks ago. Aviators are coming off of that big, big momentum-building win in SoCal in San Diego last weekend. They're two and three. They need an oomph. And I feel like if they drop either of these winnable games, it's going to put a dent into their playoff hopes. And I think similarly for San Diego and Oakland, that's going to be a battle for is San Diego still this playoff team, perennial playoff team that we're so accustomed to. They battle through everything. They fight down to the last man. Or is it finally the changing of the guard? Is it time for these new younger teams that have been underneath San Diego's reign these past couple of seasons. I mean, not last season, but the two seasons prior when they made the championship weekend, uh, you know, is it finally time for the spiders to sort of overthrow the existing hierarchy in the West? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I would add with that with LA, I think this weekend is, is notably big, not just because Oakland did win. So like mathematically, I think they kind of have to keep pace with whatever Oakland's doing to set up those Oakland LA games as potentially the deciding factor for that three seed, but also just like mentally, I mean, this LA team hasn't been over 500 yet this season, two wins this weekend that put them on a three game winning streak too. So like would give them some momentum. They'd be four and three on the year. I think it would just be very good of like setting up the rest of their season and hopefully putting them on more of an upward trajectory. Mm Mm-hmm. In the East Division, we've got Philly at Toronto, and the other game that we've already kind of mentioned was is Atlanta at Boston. Again, kind of a telltale set of battles to determine the third spot in the East Division. Mm-hmm. Philly, of course, coming off of that momentous victory last weekend at home against Carolina. They will be looking to extend their winning streak to three games in Toronto against a rush team who you and I were both really high on entering the season, but... They still are just so young and so prone to kind of the careless mistakes that often befuddle people of that age. And given Phoenix's momentum, given how the rush looks so far, 
I think Philly might win going away in this. You know, they've only won two straight games, but this has really been building for four or five. And it just feels mm-hmm. like if the rush continue down this hole of committing 25 plus turnovers a game, Philly's going to run it up on them. Like this Phoenix defense doesn't mess around with defensive chances this year. And they've, they've shown a very apt ability to convert breaks. And that's going to spell trouble for a rush team that can't really afford, I think, to not put up points. I, I, I feel like this is going right. to be a very high scoring game. And I just, I, I, I'm worried about the rush in this matchup. Philly, Philly should win this game. I mean, I think this could be like a four or five goal win for Philly. Toronto has just looked bad. They've, they've looked like, we've talked about LA, how like they look so disconnected and like they have good pieces here and there. That's like Toronto, but, but Toronto's like even lower than that. Like they, they have like singular stars, not even like tandems yet. And everyone's just kind of like doing their own things, picking their spots, but there's just no cohesiveness with that offense. The D line isn't anything special. I mean, that's never been their strength any of the last couple years. So I, I just think Toronto is is overmatched really offensively and defensively by this Philly team. But that being said, Philly has been up and down all season. I hope it and doesn't like, continue for them. I hope they can string together some momentum wins. Uh, but yeah, this this feels like a must win for Philly, and I, I think they they should absolutely get it done. And like you know, for as bad as Toronto has looked. This win, if they if they win and then Philly drops two and five and Rush go to three and three, like who that's putting Philly behind the eight ball. And it would really, I think, yeah. give a great confidence to the Rush when they go into this much, much easier back half of their schedule. Mm-hmm. I mean, they still got a yeah. game against Detroit and Pittsburgh, which are very winnable matchups <laughs> for this Rush right. team, even as bad as they look. So this could be a real turnaround moment for the rush. And I kind of expect head coach Adrian Yearwood and the rest of that coaching staff to really kind of amp up this young team at home. You know, this, this is a game yeah. that they need to have. Uh, Boston, Atlanta, we kind of already touched on. Let's move to the central Madison at Minnesota, Chicago at Indy. Again, it's just a melee right now. Everything <laughs> to do in the central division. Minnesota That's went great. up on a four, one run on Chicago who didn't look good last weekend. But only one by two goals. It's twenty to eighteen at home right. for the wind chill. They're they've obviously been struggling with injuries, lineup absences. Half of their throwing unit seems to have some kind of hip, hamstring, pelvis injury. Yeah. You know, like they're just they're down. And and what's been really nice about the wind chill though is that they seem to be able to rally in ways that maybe they haven't always had to in the past. I don't know that they re- they have some of as much talent, and I think it's forcing them to focus a little bit more and who excels in what roles and really identifying where their matchups are successful. And you can see that last week mm-hmm. with elevation to Tristan Van de Mortel and the way that he took over that offense going 76 to yeah. 76, didn't have a turnover on the game, six <laughs> scores, like his ability to just stabilize. They get Jason Sheeta back in the lineup this weekend. It mm-hmm. feels like Minnesota has a good identity of how to adjust and make each individual matchup work for themselves and not just rely on this is our strongest roster. We're going to Quinn Snyder over the top, you know, like right. they, they have a little bit more um, range in how they can attack teams. Uh, so yeah. I like them at home. Madison, of course, bringing their momentum after finally getting a win at uh, Bree Stevens on Sunday. And then Chicago and Indy, Chicago's going to be dealing with, it seems like a lot of roster absences. Lot and of absences. This is a terrific moment for an indie team that sits at three and two. They've won three straight. They're kind of quietly just moving up the standings. And each week they're getting a little bit more and more confident. Travis Carpenter looks like he's back in this all AUDL form. Mm-hmm. This is a team that we've said again and again, we know, I think better than any other central division team in 2023, they have the most stable core of players and performers and it just seems like that stability is really starting to pay off for the Alley Cats as the rest of this division kind of goes through the waviness of summer heat stroke, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Everywhere I, else this is was like each team is different depending on the week. And it's like, well, Indy, <laughs> Indy you can at least kind of set your clock by. You know what you're getting, yeah. And I think this is an opportunity for Indy to kind of like put their foot down on this Chicago series in particular. I mean, they beat Chicago in Chicago's home opener uh, to start the union season. And I, I just think like being at home in Indy, I mean, I, I worry a little bit just because yes, Chicago has got all these lineup absences, but 
when it comes to indoors, like, I don't know, this is probably going to be their most efficient looking offense we've seen this season just because of the, the no conditions factor. But still, I, I think Indy, like with the with the defensive playmaking that they've shown at a slightly elevated level over the past few games, I think they are they're going to be a team that gets better throughout the year, whereas Chicago, like you said, is going to be kind of like very lineup dependent. And I, I don't think this is a good one. And with all of that, we still have not gotten to all 13 games ahead on the week seven slate. We will be tuning in starting tomorrow night with that huge West Division game between Salt Lake and Colorado. We hope you're there as well. We will be back with you in just a couple of days to recap all this action as we reach the midway point of the 2023 regular season this weekend. How about that? How about that? Love it. We'll be discussing a lot more end of season awards, maybe some MVP picks, just sort of checking in at this big mile marker in the 2023 season. Thanks as always for tuning in with us here. We'll see you soon. Bye now.